Welcome everybody. And again, thank you for your patience as we got some little issues sorted out here. But thank you for joining us for my conversation today with Jim Murphy, uh, President and Corporate Business Executive of Invenergy. My name is Eric Burkertz and I'm the CEO of Evergreen Climate Innovations. And for those of you unfamiliar with our work, we work across the greater Midwest, providing catalytic seed capital and commercialization support to startups who are working to solve our climate and environmental challenges. And we execute our work through our 501c3 structure, which allows us to be more patient and to take on more risk than traditional investors. And we thereby help climate entrepreneurs overcome the early stage capital gap. And at Evergreen, we love to highlight entrepreneurial success stories from the Midwest. And there is no better example than Invenergy, who is building a powerhouse business from their home base right here in Chicago. And this year is Invenergy's 20th anniversary. And in this relatively short period of time, Invenergy has established themselves as the leading privately held global developer and operator of sustainable energy solutions. And in terms of scale, Invenergy has developed over 60 gigawatts or 30 gigawatts, apologies, they're going to 60, 30 gigawatts of clean energy solutions. And to give you a sense, that's enough to power 10 million or more American homes. But what's exciting about this story and why we decided to have Jim participate in this conversation is that th that's just the early innings. Invenergy is now staring at a mountain of opportunity as the world economy looks to decarbonize and move to clean energy solutions. And I'm excited to talk to Jim today to really hear about how Invenergy is thinking about this opportunity and what's in store for its next 20 years. So Jim, welcome. Thank you, Eric. Good to be here. All right. Well, uh, maybe to start, you know, I think everybody has heard about and read about the movement towards decarbonization and clean energy, but it seems like things have really just picked up a head, head of steam recently. What's different in the market today versus, you know, as recently as 24 or 36 months ago? I mean, are you seeing just dramatic changes taking place? Yeah, I, I would say, Eric, dramatic changes, but it's been a kind of a, a bumpy ride here in the last two, three years. And maybe just put in perspective for everybody, if we rewind the tape 36 months ago, so now we're in May of 19, we've got declining prices, we've got development, you know, on a steady path, you know, we really haven't hit the, the major inflection point, but we're on a steady path. Everyone is excited about the potential you know, for new climate friendly administration in DC. And, and, and you know, we, we felt we were in a very sort of exciting time at that moment. You know, now fast forward to 24 months ago, May of 2020, We've got a new administration in place. We've got a lot of optimism for the long term, but everyone is reeling from COVID. And you know, all we were about at that time was, you know, keeping the, the, the projects running, keeping the lights on, knowing how we were going to keep our employees safe. And so it was, you know, a great deal of uncertainty two years ago today. Then, you know, go forward another 12 months to May of 2021. The, the world is now adjusting to COVID, sort of a we will get through this attitude, but the supply chain challenges that started emerging related to COVID and related to other factors, those remained and, and their impacts were becoming more and more apparent and, and, and sort of problematic for our industry. We'll talk about some of that in the interview today, but I think the optimism, you know, at that time was still very much there, you know, that we were going to see, for example, a long-term climate bill and that the, the policy certainty that we needed to really take, you know, this industry decarbonization in the U.S., you know, to the next level, you know, that the pieces were in place. Okay, that, again, that was 12 months ago. Now mm -hmm. we go to today, May of 2022. Now we've got a war in Ukraine. Now we've got massive inflation, especially in the energy sector. 
We've got bottlenecks to importing our equipment. You know, so a lot of headwinds there, a lot of new headwinds, a lot of current factors going on, but still tremendous optimism for climate policy. What happened in Ukraine, you know, was a wake up call on the need for energy security. Renewable energy is a, is a key component to energy security and the continuing sort of recognition of the climate urgency, you know, all of that coming together, you know, is, is still keeping the, the uh, enthusiasm with us and within our industry very high. Yeah, well, I, I think many people read about the $3 billion investment into Invenergy by Blackstone Infrastructure Partners. I mean, that's a big number. And I imagine, you know, reading between the lines that they, you know, they moved forward that with that investment because they are seeing that opportunity and, and perhaps they're taking a longer term view and that, you know, some of these near term uh, kind of headwinds can be navigated. But um, I imagine that, you know, is a huge, you know, view on the positive road ahead. Um, how how's that money you know i think the press release talked about you know building out in energy's clean energy platform you know what does that really mean and, and how's that money really going to get deployed yeah great question uh, you know the first thing that i would say is this is a very capital intensive business and while three billion is a very big number you know it really doesn't go that far in a business like this unless you stay very disciplined and just to give you an example of the numbers we're talking about, our renewables delivery rate goal, you know, our annual sort of new projects brought online, we're trying to get to a level of about four gigawatts per year. Mm -hmm. And at today's build cost to deliver, you know, for renewable energy projects to deliver four gigawatts of projects, you're talking $8 billion of costs. And then within that $8 billion, or let's say six, let's be a little more a little more optimistic, let's say 6 billion of costs. And within that 6 billion of costs, maybe 2 billion of equity requirement. Yeah. You know, and you add on top of that, some of the new things that we're doing, we're doing some major projects in transmission, offshore wind, those projects alone are demanding more billions of dollars of capital per project. So the good news is that there are abundant capital sources out there for the construction capital needed for these projects. but what the Blackstone investment does for us is it gives us the development capital so that we can you know, really move forward with our already very ambitious program. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned uh, the need to, to you know, stay disciplined, right? Because 3 billion is a lot, but then again, you know, in, in certain contexts, it's not that much. So, yeah, I imagine every day in energy is presented with like a new business opportunity or a new line of business, whether it's going after, you know, going into the hydrogen market, whether it's going into transmission, offshore wind, long duration energy storage. Yeah. How do you decide kind of where you are going to focus and how, you know, what's the kind of the, the thought process on how you kind of separate out what you're going to focus on it and what you're going to perhaps hold off on for the near term? Well, we need to be, you know, honest with ourselves about where our capabilities are and the sort of things that got us to where we are and, and how can we build on that. And we have, you know, core competencies. We, you know, obviously we're a very engineering intensive company. We have great engineers. We have great developers. We have folks who understand, you know, how to find the best site, how to get the permits, how to contract the power from the facility how to get it financed, how to build it, how to operate it. So we need to bring those disciplines and those core competencies and, and, and lay them against the emerging opportunity. You know, offshore wind, as you mentioned, we thought was a natural transition for all of the expertise that we had built up with onshore wind. We needed to supplement that to some extent with some additional team members who were coming from the offshore business, but we've done that and, and we're, we're moving forward in that space. I think it's it's a good example of where we can really, you know, take it to the next level, transition these competencies into into new technologies, new business opportunities. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know that Invergy recently was awarded a you know a large offshore lease as part of the New York Bite auction. 
Um, so you see offshore wind as uh, sort of a next sort of growth growth potential area of growth for Invenergy. We do. We we you know we see it as potentially a, a pretty large opportunity. Uh, it's not for the faint of heart. It it requires you know a much longer development cycle than what we've been traditionally operating in. And it also develop, it also requires a great deal more capital than what we've traditionally been able to allocate to individual projects. Right. So, but but just to take a step back, Eric, when you think about the opportunity, you've got in the U.S. market, Biden administration set this goal of 30 gigawatts by 2030 in the offshore space and the East Coast, the West Coast, the Gulf Coast. In Europe, the goals are even greater than that, much greater than that, and the the flame is being fanned by calls for energy security, as I mentioned before. You know, Southeast Asia is also looking at offshore wind in a big way. And we're active in all these markets and we're building, you know, the teams and the consortiums to diversify our risk and to bring the capital that we need. Right, right. And you also, I mean, you mentioned transmission infrastructure uh, and that's a, an area that Invenergy is now focused on. Um, is that, out of necessity, are you finding that you're having to build sort of transmission to carry the power that you guys are actually producing? Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't call it necessity. I would call it opportunity. You know, we're we're, we're already an experienced trans, transmission developer. If you look at most of our renewable projects, they require some form of new transmission infrastructure to tie to the grid, right? Yeah. And so you know, some of these lines can run really long distances, like we've done 80 mile lines in the past. So we felt we had the chops to do this work. And so we, you know, I mean, now focusing on the opportunity itself, it's not a secret that most of the best renewable energy resources in the country are in, you know, predominantly rural areas, not close to load centers, and are often very much constrained in getting to the markets where they need to get to because of the lack of transmission. So, you know, that's what we saw as the opportunity. You know, we're not alone in seeing that opportunity, but we feel like we're maybe faster than others in, in trying to make it happen. You know, we understand, you know, that, that we have a lot of support from the administration who also recognizes that, you know, rebuilding and, and, and enhancing the grid is really the key to meeting their energy, their renewable energy goals and aspirations. So. We thought it was an area where we could really, you know, create quite a quite a solid business for ourselves. Right. right. And then you you met. I mean, you mentioned uh, sort of the areas, you know, thinking about where your core competencies are, and a lot of the core competencies center on you know the the steps of you know the development process. But Invergy now is also operating renewable energy projects on behalf of clients. Um, how did that business come about? Well, you know, we've always considered ourselves a world-class developer, but also a world-class operator. If you go back in time at the beginning, you know, let, let's talk about the renewable energy business. When we started the renewable energy business, you know, the only model that was available was you buy the equipment from the OEM, they install it and they operate. Well, we did that for a couple of years and we thought this isn't working. The, these guys operating our projects are not operating it the way that we would operate it. They don't have that sense of urgency. They're what we call managing to the contract. If the contract says availability needs to be a minimum of 92%, that's what you're gonna get because that's the, the requirement under the contract. We don't want 92%, we want 96%, 98%. So. We made a decision as a company that we were going to go and 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 work with these equipment providers to take over the operating side of the business. And as a result of that, we built a team, we built an operating capability that really is second to none. And we felt over the last few years that we could bring that owner's mindset, that 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 way that we operate our projects to third parties and convince them that we could do a better job than other. Uh, options that they had for plant operation and maintenance and asset management. And uh, we've been having a great deal of success doing that. Right. And you're operating a sort of a network operation center right out of, right here across the street here in Walker. 
We do. We do. In our office at One South Wacker, we have a, a very substantial operating center. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, switching gears a little bit, uh, you know, Invenergy's kind of history has been a lot of it has been around uh, developing projects in rural areas. But, uh, you know, I understand that there's a, a real focus and attention now on um, you know expanding your workforce diversifying your workforce national nationwide um and, and also really thinking about thinking hard about the question of how does the clean energy transition uh, be a just transition you want to comment on some of the things you're you're doing and thinking about in that vein yeah certainly um the first point that i would make to your question eric is i wouldn't confuse diversity or the diversity equity inclusion concept with the just transition concept they're really separate okay. uh, the dei is about improving outcomes inside of our organization you know building a diverse workforce that gives you the benefits of divergent perspectives on business matters so you're making the right business decisions or the better business decisions uh, it's something we're working hard on it in energy. We're doing it in our recruiting. We're doing it in our career development plans. We're sponsoring affinity groups in the company. We have five of them now with something like 400 members. You know, this creates opportunities for diverse employee groups to come together and, and talk about uh, issues they're dealing with in the workplace or otherwise. And so, you know, DEI per se, you know, again, internal facing, critically important. The, the just transition is more of an external facing concept. It, it's a lot of the same principles, but it's more about improving outcomes for populations outside of our organization. You know, we're, what we're trying to do with just transition or as the industry calls it, energy transition for all, is make sure that nobody is left behind, that, that the benefits of clean energy, whether it's jobs, whether it's lower utility bills, whether it's a better environment, that those are reaching people, you know, in, in across all aspects of the society, including in particular, you know, the low and moderate income communities, you know, where often our projects are located. Right. Is that, uh, was that a driver behind the joint venture with Lafayette Square to launch Reactivate? Yeah, very much so. I mean, probably the driver. So, you know, we committed to, you know, the energy transition for all concept, both individually as a company and through our trade association, working with other members of the, of, of the industry. But uh, we had a unique concept come together a couple of years ago. We were, um, we, we knew of a gentleman, you know, who had a company called Lafayette Square, which is a private equity firm. He is a, a minority individual you know, who we had known for many years, investment banker who we had done a lot of transactions with and developed a great relationship with. And we were having a conversation about this topic, energy transition for all. And we started, you know, sort of, you know, the, 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 the hatching of this idea of forming this entity, which is now called Reactivate. And what Reactivate is doing is going into these low and, and moderate income communities and creating opportunity for people through community solar, and in some cases, small scale utility solar projects. And it gives us the ability to, you know, to involve the people in these communities, whether they're gonna get some benefits of lower utility bills, whether they can be a part owner of the facilities, or whether they can um, uh, look for job opportunities, building and operating these projects training programs that we can offer to them. And also, you know, we look to procure goods and services from people in the community, in particular women and minority owned businesses operating in these communities. You know, we're gonna go out of our way to procure the goods and services we need to build these projects from those groups of people. Right. Are there particular markets you're, you're intending to launch into sort of at the top of your list? Yeah, you can't do this everywhere. We have to be targeted and we are working in New York, we're working in Illinois, we're working in the Southwest in certain communities where we can bring the benefits of community solar to folks in the indigenous communities. 
So th those are the three initial major focus areas. Right, right. And we we talked a little bit. I mean, you mentioned solar. Uh, you know, obviously, Invenergy you know is engaged in sort of large scale utility solar. We talked about um, small utility sol solar as well as community solar, but you know, obviously, the solar markets, you know, right now it, it, it is somewhat, uh, you know, uh, on hold because of the tariff in inquiry that's going on um, by commerce. Um, is it as bad out there as it sounds in the press in terms of just things screeching to a halt? Well, for the solar industry writ large, yes, it's it's pretty bad. I mean, the industry... I mean, just kind of backing up a little bit, the industry has been caught in this geopolitical battle between the U.S. and China, you know, which was caused by, you know, the U.S. doing very little to develop its own manufacturing and supply chain for PV solar panels. And so China and other Southeast Asian countries stepped in, especially China. And so now, <clears throat> excuse me, today, the vast majority of solar panels available in the U.S. market contain at least some components that are being made in China. <clears throat> Excuse me, one second. <clears throat> so there are um, concerns that have been raised that some of the manufacturing processes, you know, in a certain region in China are utilizing forced labor by ethnic community, ethnic minorities, excuse me, in that process. And, and with that premise and with pressure from the U.S. Congress, the Department of Homeland Security, through its Customs and Border Patrol, began back last November detaining cargoes of any solar panels coming into the country with any hint of Chinese content. Mm -hmm. and, and what that required is the importers of those panels to produce mass amounts of documentation to prove that there was no forced labor in their supply chain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've worked with our suppliers, we've investigated our supply chain, we've come to the determination as most of our competitors in the industry that the panels that are coming into the US market are not produced with forced labor. We've made it abundantly clear to our suppliers that we have zero tolerance for any forced labor in the supply chain. Nonetheless, this thing that the Customs and Borders has done, which is called the withhold and release order, where they're still detaining cargoes and looking through them and making sure that they have all of the paperwork necessary to, to prove something that's very difficult to prove that there is no forced labor content in the in the panels. You know, it's causing a lot of anxiety, you know, that you're you're reading and hearing in the press today and, and really slowing things down. And the slowdown has this ripple effect, right? I mean, if we can't get the panels in, you know, we have to change the construction schedule, we have to reset all of the other trades that are coming on the site. We have to reschedule the other equipment. We may have to lay people off. And I think that's the loudest voice, right? If you're laying people off, that's what's gonna get the attention of the press and of the politicians. And so you're hearing a lot of uh, a lot about that today. Now, sorry to go on and on, but it, it's sort of a long story. Right. And, and you know, the, the next chapter was what you mentioned with this Department of Commerce investigation that happened in March where a tiny U.S. panel assembly company located in California filed an or an action with the Department of Commerce claiming that the Chinese solar panel manufacturers were circumventing tariffs, and there are tariffs on imports of Chinese panels today, but that, that they're claiming that they're circumventing those tariffs by relocating parts of their manufacturing process into other Southeast Asian countries. And we, we feel like this has been litigated already, that the facts are very clear, but under the procedures that the Department of Commerce needs to follow, they need to take the case, or they felt that they needed to take the case, even though it was a case where, where you know, the, the industry as a whole felt that it was, it was a bogus case, but they took the case. And so now we're waiting for them to make a determination and they're going to make either a positive or a negative determination as to whether they think there might be circumvention. The, the problem here is while we're in this period of uncertainty, the implications of if they were to make a determination ultimately that there was circumvention going on, that the way it would work is that they could apply tariffs that could be as high as 
250% of the cost of the product. Right. This is just a complete non-starter. And what it's done is it's caused the importers to say, unless you want to indemnify me, you know, buyer, unless you want to indemnify me for this potential risk of this enormous tariff, I'm not shipping. And right. most of the customers said, okay, then don't ship. I'm going to reschedule my project. I'm going to just take a pause here. And that's where we are today. You know, we have a lot of projects that's been put on hold. We right. think we're going to see a lot of 22 projects shift into 23, maybe 23 into 24. You know, we're hoping for the right resolution. And we're hoping it comes quickly, but the industry is in a bit of a pause right now. Yeah. And, and when you say quickly, I mean, are, are we talking six months, 12 months, 24 months? What's kind of quickly in this context? Yeah, I mean, the guidance. Right and the, the, yeah, it's a good question. And the, the guidance yeah. in the Department of Commerce regulations indicate that they should make a preliminary determination in 150 days. So that would be out in August. You know, yeah. We're doing everything as an industry to motivate them. And we think the administration should be motiv motivating them because this certainly is at odds with the, administra the administration's goals of rapid and massive renewable energy deployment. But um, you know, we hope we, we can get an earlier decision, but, but, but uh, it's yet to be seen. Great, great. Well, uh, we've got a couple questions that have come into us from the audience. Um, before I go to those, uh, you know, Jim, was there anything I sort of neglected to ask or something you'd like to call out that perhaps I didn't touch upon? I, I, I thought you were going to ask me if Invenergy was hiring, Eric, and <laughs> that I can I can soundly say yes. We we have a lot of growth, as you, as you pointed out, and and we're looking for qualified candidates across all disciplines in the company. Right, which I imagine is uh, what from what I hear in every industry, you know, finding and hiring is becoming really difficult because of just the 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 sort of the, the craziness of the job market. So, uh, but I imagine you guys are scaling incredibly. So, uh, so a question, one question that caught my my eye, which I thought was somewhat interesting. Uh, there was a question about whether you see a new sort of revenue structure in clean energy, right? So, I mean, the traditional structure for years has been a you know a PPA, a power purchase agreement. Do you see any new sort of structures emerging, um, kind of, kind of coming off the PPA model to something new? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's it's all that recent. I think they've evolved over say the last ten years. You know, you know, we've seen a lot of financial products be introduced so that folks could build a merchant plant that uh, hedge their risk. And these would include you know, swaps, where you go from floating power price to fixed power price that are provided by financial players. Mm -hmm. We've seen these contracts for differences where you can, again, get price certainty on your offtake. And these contracts for differences largely being offered by commercial and industrial companies you know, who are looking to add renewable energy to their supply mix and are willing to enter into these financial contracts so that they can, you know, get that, uh, you know, that green uh, power into their power supply. Yeah. Yeah. One other thing that, that we've seen, you know, changing over the, you know, maybe the last five years is our utility customers, you know, more and more are wanting to own their own generating assets and not be on the other side of a PPA. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've been able to accommodate those desires by doing more build and transfer models where we're develop and and construct the projects and then transfer ownership to the utility you know at commercial operation date and in many cases you know continue to operate those facilities for yeah. the customer so you those are those are instances where in you would continue to provide the you know the operations of those facilities even though the ownership has been transferred yeah, we don't always do it, but we very often do that. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, another question, uh, and you know, we've heard a lot about the the need for long duration storage, but uh, kind of, how do you see sort of long duration storage uh, playing? Uh, is it are we reaching sort of are we achieving technologies that allow for longer 
duration storage that allows for sort of addressing some of the intermittency issues that you know have historically been been somewhat of a challenge well there's a tremendous amount of r&d going on and and the long duration energy storage and long duration you know be you know a day at a time a week at a time and you know some really truly long duration not eight hours or four hours but the long duration energy storage is the game changer and you know everyone is trying to find the technology and the technology that makes sense economically but we're not there yet and and you know our expectation is until we get there we're continuing to see the need for different kind of solutions to deal with the intermittency whether that's peaking plants whether that's grid enhancements, more transmission, um, better use of um, smart um, technologies that can take advantage of uncorrelated generating resources and utilizing them at the appropriate times in the generating stack. That's the sort of thing going on right now. Uh, the long duration will come, we hope it will come, but we're not there. And similar, uh, another question around, you know, hydrogen. Where where does kind of hydrogen fit in your, you know, kind of your roadmap? Um, I mean, are you seeing green hydrogen being a kind of a, a, a core piece to the kind of the, the platform for energy in the years ahead? I think green hydrogen, maybe a little bit like long duration storage. It's something that it's coming, but it's not there. And we, you know, it's something that we want to make sure that we're smart about. We have a, a pilot program right now where we're testing green hydrogen. We have an electrolyzer <clears throat> that we're installing at a small PV facility. And we want to be ready, you know, if we see the economics working as well. There are things potentially in, in a climate bill that may come through that could, that could be very beneficial to the development of more you know, green hydrogen, you know, through tax credits, but we're not there now. And, and, you know, I think that the, the, the green hydrogen opportunity is, is going to be more focused on applications where you have industrial processes, where you can put an electrolyzer there and generate hydrogen right at the, at the use site and provide the electricity for that electrolyzer through contracts and not per se you know, being at the at the site. All right, we have uh, one last question, and then I think we'll need to wrap up. Uh, but a few minutes ago, you mentioned you know, Invenergy is, is hiring. You're scaling. Um, as you do that, how are you? I mean, Invenergy had a very you know entrepreneurial culture. You know, it's been able to move quickly, break things, if you will, you know, if you know what I mean. Um, but as you scale and add people and add people on a very distributed basis, you know, how do you, how, what are you doing to ensure that that culture or the good parts of that culture stay alive and you don't lose that and become kind of too staid and too calcified as a corporation? Yeah, yeah. Clearly, it's a challenge. But you know, we, 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 it's a challenge we have to take on because if we don't maintain our, our foundation, our culture, we will not be able to differentiate ourselves from our competition. And over the years, you know, that's really been a hallmark of Invenergy. Our customers, you know, our regulators, or the, our suppliers, our financiers, they view us as a different kind of a company. And, and I think a key ingredient to doing that and one that we will continue to do is to stay a private company. And as a private company, we can really focus on one thing, creating value, creating value for our stakeholders, for our employees, for our customers, for our investors. You know, we, can, we can focus on creating value and not be distracted or constrained by some of the artificial constructs that the public companies work in, quarterly earnings or, or the need to, to show progress on a certain schedule as opposed to when it's you know naturally going to occur. So we try to, to, to stay focused and, and, and to not be taking our eye off the, the value ball, so to speak. Right. Right. Another one, Eric, is, is communication. We, we need to communicate to our teams 
the how and the why of the business decisions that we make. We need to make sure that that permeates the organization, that people you know, are, are able to, to do what the senior management and the middle management is doing and, and to take the ball and be able to do that themselves over the years. And, and you know, as, as we have over the last 20 years, maybe the last piece of this puzzle is we, we need to never get complacent. And we have to keep trying to do new things. You said breaking things. That was a good word to, to use here. We need to take the calculated risks and we're going to make mistakes. But it's in those mistakes that we learn and in those mistakes that the innovation occurs. And so we, we try to encourage our teams to take those calculated risks. And I think that those are the sorts of things, kind of all of those things I just said, working together will be the way we maintain the culture you know, that served us so well. All right. Well, Jim, we're uh, we're up uh, up at the kind of the closing time here. So again, thank you for 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 your time. This has been great, uh, and thank you to everybody who joined us today to to listen in. Uh, we are going to make this recording available on our website in our YouTube channel. So uh, if you know others who might enjoy listening to it, please do share the link and. Final word before we drop, uh, you know, we have over the years held our big annual event here in Chicago called Co-Invest Climate. Uh, COVID uh, kind of interfered with that the past two years, but uh, come September 7th this year, we're going to be back live in person here in Chicago. We're already hard at work developing the, the, the agenda and, and preparing. So, uh, please uh, register and attend. Uh, it'll be a good event. And Jim, thank you. And thank you to the Invenergy team for all you do. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Enjoyed it. All right. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.